Thank you very much, Brian. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. I perhaps mistakenly had the impression that one should start off with something to do with Metropolitan Andrei Sheptitsky, so that's why he's in the title and his picture is there. And uh, also I was told recently uh, by someone from Europe, they attended a lecture here on an obscure topic of Eastern Christianity, and they said that it seemed like the content was based off of Wikipedia. So I'm going to start in a similar uh, way that... Um, According to the first words of the Encyclopedia Entry for Music in the Canadian edited Encyclopedia of Ukraine, quote, Ukrainians are known popularly as a musical people. <laughs> so, the foremost names of Ukrainian musical history, such as Bortnyansky, Vedel, Berezovsky, Leontovich, uh, Listen, Kostetsenko, to name just a few, all began their careers in the sacred music industry as church singers and composers writing music that has entered standard repertoires of church singing in Ukraine and throughout the world. Nevertheless, at the basis of many of their compositions lie the chant melodies of previous centuries sung in monasteries and brotherhoods in Ukraine from before their transcription in manuscript Irmologia from the 16th century onward. Considering the importance of church singing for liturgical worship in Eastern Christianity, it comes as no surprise that both the Orthodox and Greco-Catholic churches in present-day Ukraine took measures to develop, preserve, and spread their liturgical chant traditions, which became an intense undertaking at the end of the 19th and the beginning of the 20th centuries. But how they did so and how effective they were in transmitting this tradition after the fall of the Soviet Union at the end of the 20th century depends on each church and context. This afternoon, I would like to examine two specific church singing traditions around the time of Metropolitan Andrei Sheptitsky's life. So Sheptitsky, a patron of the sacred arts, who was Metropolitan of Lviv in Western Ukraine at the beginning of the 20th century, and after whom this Sheptitsky Institute is named. The two sacred music traditions I will be talking about are those of the Kiev Caves Lavra, one of Ukraine's oldest and most influential monasteries, and the Lviv Stavropihil Brotherhood, one of Ukraine's oldest confraternities. Both of them represent local sacred music traditions within the broader tradition of Ukrainian sacred music. Both fostered church singing through book printing, education, and choirs. Both have their churches and buildings inscribed in the UNESCO list of World Heritage Sites. Both flourished at the end of the 19th century and were shut down during the 20th century. Although the Kiev Lavra has its origins in the middle of the 11th century and the Lviv Brotherhood dates to the end of the 16th century, both institutions took steps to preserve their respective musical traditions at the end of the 19th and beginning of the 20th centuries initiatives which were subsequently interrupted by the First and Second World Wars and the liquidation of both institutions by the Soviet regime. How their sacred music heritage was then revived after the fall of communism and Ukrainian independence in 1991 is the focus of this presentation at the end. As we shall see, the revival of these sacred music traditions depend on how well they were safeguarded before their liquidation. After a very brief introduction to the church in Ukraine and its musical tradition, I will present the 20th century activity of each of these two institutions, before and after communism, to understand how the approaches they took allowed their liturgical music traditions to be revived and preserved, and how the emphasis and direction given to revival and restoration of traditions by the church hierarchy influenced this process. So... First, let me say something about church singing in Ukraine and the history of Ukraine in the 20th century. After Christianization of Kiev and Rus, the medieval empire that covered the territory of Ukraine, Belarus, and Western Russia in 988 from Constantinople, the common East Slav liturgical chant tradition began to diversify so that by the 16th century, we can roughly say that there existed what is called Znamany chant in the north, today's Moscow and Novhorod, and Kievan chant in the southwest. Kievan chant became the common foundation for all church music in Ukraine, including the chants of the Kiev Caves Lavra and the Stavropihil Brotherhood. Influenced by close contact with the Catholic West, Kievan chant came to be written in Western notation with square notes, and over time, its harmony was influenced by a mix of Western polyphony and local folk music. Contact with the Catholic West also brought the Orthodox Church of Central and Western Ukraine into union with Rome after the Union of Brest in 1596, 
setting the stage for the split between the Orthodox and Eastern Catholic churches that exists in Ukraine to this very day. Kiev Lavra never accepted this union and has been within the jurisdiction of the Orthodox Church ever since the end of the 16th century, first under the direct jurisdiction of the Patriarchate of Constantinople as a Stavropihil monastery, and then being annexed by the Kievan Metropolitan and absorbed into the Russian Orthodox Church at the end of the 17th century. The Lviv Brotherhood, on the other hand, opposed union with Rome until 1709, after which the Brotherhood became part of what is known today as the Ukrainian Greco-Catholic Church. Despite this division, the liturgical tradition of these two churches is basically the same, the Orthodox Byzantine Slavonic tradition with minor local variations. Ukrainian political history in the 20th century has a significant impact on church life. That's an understatement. And anyone who has followed the news about Ukrainian autocephaly since the end of April this year will understand that this sub subject is extremely complex, and I won't say anything more about that here. All that needs to be kept in mind for the sake of the topic of sacred music this afternoon is that during the 20th century alone, the cities of Kiev and Lviv were controlled by at least eight different powers, with both cities suffering extensive losses of human life and destruction of churches as a result of the First and Second World Wars, Nazi occupation, and communist repressions. Concerns to safeguard sacred music traditions were sometimes secondary in these extreme conditions. So keeping this in mind, let us now turn to the two examples of church singing in the Kievan church at the heart of this presentation. Although church music was an integral part of the liturgical life of the Kiev Caves Lavra since its foundation by St. Anthony of the Caves in 1051, the earliest extant manuscripts of Kiev Caves Lavra chant date to the 16th or 17th century. These music manuscripts are written in Western square notation, presenting the melody of the monophonic chants of the proper and ordinary of the liturgical year. However, liturgical books without music continued to be the most frequently printed books at the Lavra until the 19th century, showing that oral transmission was still the main method of singing and learning the chants. The Lavra's singing was known for its impressive beauty, and its admirers included tsars and composers such as Tchaikovsky, among others. In order to preserve local chant melodies, the Holy Synod of the Russian Orthodox Church issued a decree in 1846 that every diocese and region should prepare faithful transcriptions of their monophonic and polyphonic chants and submit them to the Synod in St. Petersburg. The first transcriptions of the melodies at the Lavra began in 1852, and between 1865 and 1873, monks and professional musicians transcribed all the remaining chants of the liturgical music books of the Lavra for the first time into modern staff notation. This was followed by the establishment of a commission of the Lavra's monk presenters, so choir directors, in 1905 that was charged with producing an updated set of liturgical music books that would also transcribe the harmonizations of the chants. The results of the commission can be seen in the four volumes of the so-called Obichod collection. That is, the All Night Vigil and Divine Liturgy appeared in 1910, the Twelve Great Feasts in 1912, and the Hymns of Great Lent and Holy Week in 1915. And so uh, I started with an encyclopedia entry online, and I will go one step lower and turn it also into a bit of show and tell. So uh, here's an example of the Divine Liturgy book, and you can pass this along. It's a copy from the library here at the Institute. The manuscript of a fifth volume for the period of Easter and the Pentecostarion, that is the period between Easter and Pentecost, the 50 days, was ready in 1918, but funding could not be secured to publish it due to the collapse of the Russian Empire and the revolution. This volume was only published after the fall of communism in independent Ukraine. The harmonization was carried out according to the general practices of singing cave and chant. The second tenor sang the melody, with the first tenor uh, harmonizing by singing a third above the melody, while the bass voice normally sang on the first, fourth, and fifth scale degrees, and the baritone generally sang on the tonic or dominant. So in general, you have the melody and you harmonize a third above. When these general guidelines deviated from the actual singing in the choirs of the Lavra, attention was paid to follow the peculiarities of the Lavra chant tradition. These included frequent parallel octaves between the melody and the bass voice, parallel fifths between the tenors and baritone, introductory bass solos to intone the initial verses of special chants, 
and descant uh, added above the first tenor by boy altos. So in general, these parallel octaves or parallel fifths break all the rules of Western music. The boy altos would also carry out the function of the canonar, that is, the duty of a singer who would intone verses of the text of hymns from the propers that were then repeated by the choir, since the other singers did not have books and would sing by memory or have texts intoned to them. So kind of like in the army when you're marching, you know, I don't know, but I've been told, and then the people marching repeat. The process of modernization, so an update of the Lavra tradition, was taken one step further. In 1911, the Kiev branch of the record company Extrafon recorded 68 chants of the Kiev Caves Lavra sung by the Lavra's monastic choir, directed by Ihuman Flavian Prichodko. And here we have an excerpt from one of those recordings. Uh, so Psalm 1, Blessed is the Man, the first Kathisma of the Psalter, sung at uh, Vespers uh, in Feast and Saturday evening. So I hope this will not now get too loud. And uh, before I play the recording, please remember these are recordings from over 100 years ago. The quality is not as good. When I presented a similar lecture to students from Notre Dame, after I played it, they asked, were these recordings made in the caves? Because the, it sounded so scratchy and so old. No, they sang above the caves. In any case, uh, it's a bit scratchy. First psalm, uh, you can imagine it could probably actually be an all-night vigil, um, and you hear the intonation by bass voice of the beginning with this melody, and then the boy uh, descant voices intoning the verses. The canonarchs were probably the young boys because they still had a good voice and vision, uh, whereas once you got older, they didn't have glasses. This is a tradition at least recorded even in the Paterikon of the cave caves, Lavra, with two canonarchs, young boys and their relics, uh, Geronti and Leonti, are still in the, in the Lavra. They have smaller caskets than the rest of the monks. Um, so, Father Flavian's commendable initiative to take advantage of the latest technology and chronicle the Lavra singing tradition for posterity actually became the cause of his expulsion from the monastery. According to certain witnesses, after the distribution of the recordings of the Lavra's chants, the Holy Synod of the Russian Orthodox Church began to receive complaints that records of the Kiev Cave Slavra singing were being played in places of ill repute, including Parisian cafes, considered completely inappropriate for church music. So when the superior of the Lavra, who had given his blessing initially for the recordings, was asked to account for this heinous deed, he blamed it all on Father Flavian, who was then expelled from the Brotherhood and transferred to a hermitage of the Lavra, the Kitai of Pustin in the suburbs of Kiev, where he served until his death in 1933. 
It was Father Flavian's expulsion from the Lavra that led to the decline of the monastery's chanting tradition. Father Flavian was replaced by hieromonk Yador Tkachenko, a talented musician, but not one who was wholeheartedly committed to the Lavra's musical traditions, since his tastes lay more in free musical compositions and Baroque or classical music. His editorial work on the great Lent volume of the Obichod resulted in a much smaller and thinner publication, which was nonetheless criticized for not faithfully transcribing the chant as it was sung according to oral tradition. The Labra was the first Orthodox monastery to face persecution from the communists already in 1918, when the Orthodox Metropolitan of Kiev, Vladimir Bohoyevlensky, was dragged from his residence at the Labra and shot on the street outside the monastery. After gradual collectivization in the early 1920s and finally closure in the 1930s, and the monks themselves organized themselves into a, uh, a, a committee, or a, not a kolhosp, but, uh, but uh, a committee of Soviets. Some of the monks were uh, sympathetic to those tendencies. Uh, so after the final closure, the nearly 500 monks and 200 novices who were left and who did not renounce their monastic vows were either imprisoned or sent to live outside of Kiev. During the Nazi occupation of Kiev in 1941, the Lavra was allowed to reopen and new monks were permitted to join the monastery until the 1950s, when it's, uh, it reached its peak of 87 monks. During this period, however, music books continued to be copied uh, before the monastery was finally closed by the Soviets in 1961. And so here we have a handwritten copy from 1957. Apart from monasteries, confraternities, and brotherhoods played an important role in church singing and education in Ukraine as well, and as early as the 12th century. Brotherhoods were established in urban centers in order to guarantee care for the sick, to offer insurance and burial privileges, and to care for the upkeep of their local churches. The Lviv Staropihil Dormition Brotherhood and Institute was one of the best-known brotherhoods in Ukraine and the most influential center of church chant and singing in western Ukraine and Galicia. Since its official foundation in 1586 by the charters of Patriarch Joachim of Antioch, which was later reconfirmed by Patriarch Jeremias Trenos of Constantinople in 1589, the Lviv Brotherhood received the title Stavropihion, meaning it answered directly to the Patriarch of Constantinople without the intervention of the local bishop. The Brotherhood School, also known as the Stavropihil Institute, soon came to be known as a center of learning and culture, housing a boarding school for boys whose uh, curriculum included Greek, Latin, and Church Slavonic, as well as subjects such as grammar, dialectics, rhetoric, and mathematics, and became the model for similar schools in Kiev and Vilnius. Members of the Brotherhood came from the nobility and merchant classes and helped to finance its various activities. One such activity for which the Brotherhood was particularly known was book printing, with its publications reaching lands as far off as Russia, the Balkans, and Palestine during the 18th century. The first ever Slavonic printed music book, the Lviv Irmolohion, was published here in 1700, which the Brotherhood continued to reprint with certain modifications until 1904. And so here is um, the 1904 edition. And uh, there, here's another earlier publication of the Brotherhood that you can also look at. The first pages of the 1904 edition contain a brief introduction to square notation, the Kievan notation. The remainder of the book is then arranged according to the eight tones of the Octoikos, each of which contains monophonic chants for stichera, troparia, antiphons, prokimena, and the irmi of canons for the whole liturgical year, the great feasts, and great Lent, as well as several chants for the liturgy of St. Basil the Great, including 11 cherubic hymns. A companion to the Irmalohion, the Hlasopisnitz, or roughly translated the tone singer, was published by priest Isidore Dolnitsky, at the Brotherhood's Press in 1894 and was intended as a supplement with simpler chants to those found in the Irmolohion, as well as some chants that are not found in the Irmolohion. The book, however, only provides the melody and does not explain how the chants were to be executed. A detailed account by priest Porfiri Bajansky, a former professor of church singing and liturgy at the Lviv Seminary and the Stauropihil Brotherhood, published a manual in 1890 that explains two possible methods. The first is with three voices. The first voice, called the prim, carried the melody. 
the Ftur, or second voice, harmonized below the melody consistently in thirds, and the tenor held the dominant above the melody. The second, more impressive mode of harmonizing was seven-part harmony, consisting of the first, second, and tenor voices described in the first method, along with boys doubling the three voices, called dishkant, or descant, secund, second soprano, and alt, or alto, and adding a bass part, frequently doubling the ftur, the second voice, but also singing on the first, fourth, and fifth scale degrees. So, in general, this method uh, was similar to that of the Kiev Lavra, except that in Lviv, the melody was harmonized a third below instead of a third above, reflecting common differences in folk music between Western and Central Ukraine. So I guess those who know Ukrainian folk music or even Christmas carols can sometimes tell, you know, if, if some Christmas carol is more from Central Ukraine, then you harmonize it a third above, and if it's from Western Ukraine, generally you harmonize a third below, although there are exceptions. Bozhansky stressed that the method of the Lviv Brotherhood was to be learned intuitively and by ear so that no additional music was written besides the melody already printed in the Irmolo Hyon. It was to be learned in ten lessons of two hours each, highlighting his emphasis upon the words over the music in liturgical chant, his strong opposition to musical choirs, and his belief in the easy learning of this type of singing by an average person with a liturgical text in front of them. Members of the Brotherhood Choir included boys studying at the Institute's school and men from the Brotherhood. In 1903, for example, there were 25 boys and six men singing under the direction of the prefect, or Nastoyatel, and presenter of the choir, Ilya Tsyoroch, who immigrated to the United States after the First World War. From 1900 to 1939, the Brotherhood became embroiled in national politics, passing between Galician Russophiles and Ukrainian populists. The subsequent unpopularity of the Russophiles and the pro-Ukrainian slant of musicologists such as Boris Kudrik may explain why the Stavropihion is rarely mentioned in the context of Galician church singing after the First World War. During the first Soviet occupation of Lviv in 1939, the Brotherhood was closed. It is unclear if the Brotherhood was opposed to making audio recordings or considered recordings to be taking church singing out of the context of prayer. In any case, the only recording that I know from, uh, of from the Brotherhood's church is one from Easter 1939 from a radio broadcast of the Metropolitan's Easter homily, so only a few months before the, the Soviet uh, occupation, first Soviet occupation of Lviv and before the Brotherhood was closed. So here is an excerpt from In the Flesh You Fell Asleep or Plot You, Usnu, the Exapostilarion of Pascha uh, from the Lviv Irmolahion. It should be noted that this style of singing existed side by side with other practices such as devotional hymns uh, promoted and circulated by, for example, the Bazilian Fathers during the 20th century, which uh, Boris Kudrik described in his monograph on Ukrainian liturgical music, church music as urbanization and Americanization of church music. Uh, a brief survey of these books shows an evolution from publications in Church Slavonic type, which included troparia at the beginning of each section, to editions in modern orthography with more modern compositions in text. One positive element in this development was the continued composition of new hymns and the use of the living language understood by everyone, although the adaptation of older hymns often meant that the profoundly theological meaning of texts in Church Slavonic was sometimes dumbed down and modified in order to fit the rhythm of the music. As a patron of church music and as a pastor of the diverse flock entrusted to him in Lviv, Metropolitan Andrei Sheptetsky established schools for cantors and norms for their work in the church. And here we have 
um, a kind of a guidebook with an oath that a cantor should take uh, in his service in the church. The result was an educated guild of church singers who knew their tradition and its sources. And here we have an example of the Napivnik uh, Tsirkovni by Polotnyuk, uh, published in 1902. And these cantors knew their sources. For example, here on the left side of the introduction, he lists uh, 16 sources, or 15 sources that he uses, uh, printed books, uh, various categories, Irmologia going back to 1700, and uh, shows contact and a network uh, of international cantors, including consulting cantors in Jersey City. And this is 1902 in view, or sorry, Peremishin. Szeptycki also formally promoted a model of church singing that brought together choir singing with congregational singing in the same liturgical services. This model is laid out in his 1941 pastoral letter regarding church singing presented at the Lviv Archiparchial Council of 1941. The pastoral letter navigates potential divisions and tensions, proposing a balanced theological foundation. Szeptycki begins his letter by emphasizing that church services are to be sung, likely addressing the problem of recited divine liturgies, a lamentable practice still present among some Greco-Catholics. Prayer as a service to God must not only involve our mind and heart, but also our body and our whole being, including our, quote, sense of beauty, of melody, rhythm, and harmony, end quote. Although music is important, it is, quote, primarily subservient to the idea expressed by the prayer's text. This singing must confine itself to an interpretation of that text, and since this singing is to be prayer as such, it is never to supplant, alter, or destroy the text, nor should it vie for preeminence, end quote, since it is an augmentation of the gospel proclamation. Being prayer, church singing maintains an ethical character, which should lead the singers to avoid any expression of, quote, compositional or vocal showmanship, achieved by contrived intricacy, end quote, or, quote, sensuality and passion, end quote, so that it expresses the Christian virtue of modesty and humility. After a brief overview of the history of music in worship, mainly using the examples of St. Ambrose and St. Augustine, Szeptycki arrives at Galicia and the contemporary state affair of affairs within his own church, stating that, quote, our right also requires all the people sing and in this way take part effectively in church services. This participation is a very important characteristic of our right. Through it, people learn the Christian life, end quote. Szeptycki goes so far as to say that without the participation of the people in the singing of the service, they are not included in the, quote, sacrifice and prayer of the priest, end quote. It is worth noting that other authors on congregational singing correct Szeptycki's slightly clericalist tone, writing that it is not only the priest that serves the liturgy, but that everyone that sings, both those in the choir and those praying, do, sovershayut, or serve, pravyat, the service, together with the priest, deacon, and reader. This is possible only when the people are not passive listeners, so that they might truly be those who accomplish or celebrate the service. So, the sovershitelame bohoslujenia. From a musical perspective, congregational singing is often considered low quality and the result of the decline and degradation of choral singing. Yet even those musicologists who con uh, confront it cannot deny its authentic expression of prayer. Miroslav Antonovich wrote that even when congregational singing is loud and drags, it leaves a great impression. Ivan Gardner echoes this, writing that one cannot truly understand the beauty of congregational singing unless one has experienced it several times. After such an experience, one arrives at the conclusion that, quote, it is not the musical quality of the singing that is important, but the common participation in the worship, end quote. Although such sentiments might seem to discourage choral singing and creativity, Szeptycki's pastoral letter encourages composers, writing that, quote, a composer must perceive, as if by intuition, the actual spirit of his native church, which does not prevent him from being himself, and not only imitate old patterns. The only crucial consideration is that the choral singing be authentic high art, flowing from a sincere ecclesial spirit grounded in tradition, end quote. Thus, the chants of the Irmolohion were to be honored and preserved as, quote, the heritage of the fathers. 
The popular chant style, known as Samoyilka, was to be encouraged as the means of congregational participation. And the creativity of composers was to be promoted, especially those whose choral works were appropriate and sensitive to the spirit of the church, whose works, quote, although modern, are tied to antiquity by their ethos, end quote. All these types of church singing were to come together within the divine services of the church so that, quote, certain things are sung by the whole congregation while others by the choir, end quote. And here we have the choir book uh, from St. George's Cathedral uh, published in 1927 as small fascicules. And uh, it's just worth noting that uh, in 1927, in the time of Metropolitan Dreshaptitsky, the repertoire included... Uh, Rachmaninov, Grechaninov, and Tchaikovsky, I would say as much or more so than local Galician composers. So interesting, uh, the content of the repertoire there. The more practical considerations arising from Sheptitsky's uh, decree were addressed in guidelines outlining the establishment of a church singing commission to be occupied with questions of musicology, composition, conducting, the Irmolahion, and congregational singing. The commission was to judge the merit of existing and new compositions and to approve them for church singing. Selecting appropriate music was aided by the inclusion of a list of approved contemporary composers, among them Ludkevich, Keshekevich, Polotnyuk, Dolnetsky, and the Orthodox composer Kirill Stetsenko. Local chants were to be recorded and organized, exemplary cantors and choir directors were to be acknowledged by the Metropolitan, and congregational singing was to be continually promoted. But little of this could be implemented after the return of the Soviets to Western Ukraine in 1944. Their arrival led to the official liquidation of the Greco-Catholic hierarchy in 1945 and the dissolution of the whole Greco-Catholic Church in 1946. After the closure of the Stavropihion in 1939, the Brotherhood was disbanded and there was no particular center to foster liturgical singing in the Greco-Catholic Church. In the Diaspora, seminaries continued to teach singing according to the Irmlohion and Hlasopisnitz and prepared their own liturgical music books, uh, often with notated harmonizations. The necessity to write down the harmonies suggests that the living tradition, uh, the living oral tradition was being forgotten. Within the Soviet Union, those parishes that had joined the Moscow Patriarchate were permitted to continue their liturgical practices, including their liturgical chants, while the clergy faithful to Rome continued to study church singing in their catacomb seminaries, organized secretly in private homes in Western Ukraine. So yes, even in the catacombs, there were lessons of church singing. This musical training, however, was generally limited to learning the ordinary of the divine liturgy and most likely did not include more complex chants of the Irmolahion, although sometimes you find exceptions. So, The Lviv Brotherhood's Irmolahion was reprinted in the 1950s by the Basilian Press in Toronto and copies could be found in many Greco-Catholic parishes in the diaspora, uh, unfortunately though very often gathering dust in the choir loft that was not used anymore. But... The revival of sacred music in the Kievan church after the fall of communism is a story of contrasts, or a tale of two cities, or in Canadian terms, two solitudes. So revival at the Lavra got a head start in connection with the celebrations of the millennium of Christianity in Russia and Ukraine in 1988. The Council of Ministers of the Ukrainian SSR decreed to return the Lavra to the church in May 1988, after which the first liturgy was served on the 24th of June 1988. The current director of the left choir of monks, Archimandrite Polikarp Linenko, described the singing at that first liturgy as, quote, quite inept, end quote, and uh, noted that fights often broke out regarding the order of services or the style of singing. <coughs> So, because many of the monastery buildings had been destroyed, work focused on restoring infrastructure. Nevertheless, daily services began from that day onward, with the nine would-be monks who reported for duty in 1988 commuting to the monastery from their private apartments. Few monks had survived the Soviet period, meaning that the church hierarchy at the time preferred to allow young monks to enter the restored monastery, rather than random monks and celibate priests uh, then allowing random monks and celibate priests to live in the Lavra for fear that they would bring their old habits with them and complicate the process of forming a new community. 
Nevertheless, the superior of the monastery, uh, at that time Archimandrite Yonafan Yeletskik, now <coughs> metropolitan and himself an accomplished musician, uh, and his works are sung by the Kiev Chamber Choir. There's the Liturgy of Peace that's, that's known, that's based on Gregorian chant, actually. That's his composition. So um, Archimandrite Yonafan Yeletskik sought guidance from Father Spiridon Luk- uh, Lukic, a monk of the Lavra since 1921, who knew the local particularities of the liturgical services and the chanting tradition of the Lavra and had outlived communism. Father Spiridon's arrival smoothed things over since he was recognized as the bearer of the monastery's traditions and was held in high respect by the monks. Revival of the Lavra's chants was accompanied with a revival of the liturgical traditions particular to the Lavra, including prescriptions for the use of the canon arc, for divisions of the singing between the right and left choirs, and for the participation of the two choirs in processions or entrances during the liturgy. And here is a video clip from Vespers for the feast of the deposition of the robe of the Theotokos, so Saturday evening, July 15, 2001, um, according to the old calendar. Uh, you can observe the right and left choirs coming together in the middle of the church and singing with the help of a boy alto canonarch who reads out the text of the Stichiron to the Theotokos that the monks are singing one verse at a time. So this is... uh the rest of it you can stay after. Uh, What's worth commenting here is the the possibility for people to participate with the canon arc when somebody intones the verse then in theory everybody can sing along and uh, if you're looking on how to involve youth in liturgy and prayer then here's one option. Yeah, Uh, Maybe not for everybody but definitely uh, kids can figure it out too. It's not that complicated. Uh, so this is an amateur video, but in the last 20 years, the Lavra has established uh, a recording studio that produces CDs of liturgical chants, DVDs of services, and documentaries about the Lavra singing, uh, church music books, so this one printed in 2008, a continuation of the previous projects, and runs its own YouTube channel and even has live streaming of liturgical services. So there's nothing going on now, but uh, if you can tune in live for daily services. Uh, curiously, the fall of communism did not see the rebirth of the Lviv Brotherhood. The Lviv Brotherhood's Church of the Dormition ended up in the hands of the relatively small Ukrainian autocephalous Orthodox Church, which restored the Brotherhood more or less in name only, neglecting its former school, church singing traditions, and publishing activities. The building seen here via Google Maps Street View, bearing the name Stauropihil Institute, is more or less a technical high school that has nothing in common with the Brotherhood that promoted church singing in Lviv a century ago. The largest jurisdiction in Lviv with a natural claim to the inheritance of the Lviv Brotherhood is today the Ukrainian Greco-Catholic Church, just as before the Second World War. 
After the dust settled from property disputes in Lviv in the mid-1990s, the Greco-Catholic Church did not seek to regain the Dormition Church or restore the Brotherhood's activity in sacred music. Instead, it shifted focus to promote education, establishing the Ukrainian Catholic University in Lviv, for example. The university is uh, home to uh, an institute of liturgical studies where Irmolohian manuscripts are catalogued and studied by the foremost expert of Ukrainian sacred monody, Yuri Yasinovsky, and he's recognized by Orthodox Catholics, atheists, anybody. He is the foremost authority on this topic at Ukrainian Catholic University. Yes. Here's a plug for Ukrainian Catholic University. <laughs> Other faculty members at the university are currently recording harmonized chants from the 1904 Lviv Irmolohion in modern Ukrainian for educational purposes. Each CD is accompanied with a booklet with music written in Western notation so that people can learn the texts and chants by singing along. The booklets also include brief introductory essays explaining the theological meaning of the various hymns. So... Um, here I have an audio. I don't have the example with me to pass. Oh, oops. Oh. There is no link. Aha, uh -huh. yeah, that's why it's transparent. Okay, well, you'll just have to buy the CD from Ukrainian Catholic <laughs> University. Yes. Yeah. Um, and in any case, in this audio, you would hear the melody. But the harmonizations are not based on the tradition of the Lviv Brotherhood described by Porfiry Bezhansky. So this either three-part or seven-part harmoniz harmonization, um, including boys and, even, uh, and men. Uh, instead, these new harmonizations adopt a moving ison drone, similar to Greek uh, Byzantine chant, showing a preference for Byzantine chant. The general trend in the Ukrainian Greco-Catholic Church uh, yeah, speaking generally, especially in keeping with Metropolitan Andrei Sheptitsky's letter regarding church singing and the Second Vatican Council's <coughs> emphasis on active participation of the faithful, has been to prefer congregational singing and to limit the Irmolohion, partially as a result of the lack of trained cantors or singers, making simplified chants for two or three voices more feasible. Nevertheless, the diffusion of these recordings and the revival of this traditional uh, chant is made difficult without the clear support of the hierarchy in a place of worship, namely a concrete place and a specific church where the singing tradition is to be fostered. So. The two examples of church singing in the Cavan churches from the 19th and 20th centuries presented here reveal a common tradition with centuries-old common roots, but manifested in the 20th century through two different approaches. And here you see, you can even see it visually, how the uh, dogmatic kondo uh, theotokion for the first tone for Saturday evening vespers, above you have the melody from the caves, caves Lavra with the four-part harmonization they sing, and the same piece of music uh, from uh, the Lviv Brotherhood from the Irem Lohion, basically less, more or less the same melody, just they didn't write down the harmonization. So, these two approaches have become even more um, apparent after the fall of communism and Ukrainian independence in the various ways that revival and restoration was implemented, or not. Nevertheless, both ultimately aim to preserve a living liturgical singing tradition that leads people in prayer to God. The revival of church singing at the Kiev Caves Lavra after communism was motivated by a desire to restore the tra tradition as it had been before the monastery's closure. Reliance upon printed books, along with oral tradition, as preserved by those monks who had outlived the Soviet Union, made this possible, especially thanks to the foresight of monks at the start of the 20th century who transcribed the traditional harmonizations and made recordings, even in the face of opposition to the use of modern technology and reprimands from the church hierarchy. The example of Human uh, Flavian. Although the Lviv Brotherhood was never truly revived after Ukrainian independence, elements of its sacred music tradition continue to live on here and there within the Ukrainian Greco-Catholic Church. The oral tradition of harmonization that had accompanied the Brotherhood's Irmolohion did not survive communism, and no recordings were made to transmit this way of singing to the present generation. As, at least as far as I understand, if someone out there watching this YouTube video has other recordings, please contact me. 
Nevertheless, the melodies of the chants are still sung, albeit either in unison or with more contemporary harmonizations, ones that are also more practicable with the loss of the genuine oral tradition and trained singers. What the future holds for Ukrainian church singing uh, depends on the vision and the support of the current leadership of the church and the interest of the next generation of singers desiring to praise the name of the Lord in song. Thank you.